coincidence. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're live yeah. again, right in the middle of one of our funny stories that we can't yeah, tell, on, we can't tell on the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she was well, very nice. That was very nice. So, Welcome, yeah. everybody. Welcome to Thursday night. Gosh, we missed you last week. We, we, we were both tied up and taking the holiday and glad you're all here. So, yes, indeed. Yeah, we were. Yeah, I was in... Yonkers. <laughs> what can uh, I say? My comment like about Yonkers. saying we were all tied up was not meaning that. Oh. All right. So you were, <laughs> oh, we, we were tried that yet. <laughs> occupied. <laughs> oh, okay. Packing list for next week. Zip ties. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. That is wrong. That is wrong. <laughs> I caused this one myself, but I'm still doing it. <laughs> you, got, yeah, you did cause that yourself, actually. Bless my Superman. heart. <laughs> yeah. <Superman. laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you notice on my sent out cards, I sent people pictures that they would enjoy. And for a while, I was putting what I meant to put was hashtag fridge worthy. Okay. Except I spelt it F R I G. <laughs> That's so just wrong. Frig worthy. <laughs> and you know, Pe Peg said on the call that one, but she said, um, refrigerator doesn't have a D in it. I said, yeah, but trust me, when someone gets that and I wrote frig worthy, they're thinking the same thing I'm thinking right now. <laughs> They're not thinking, there's no D in fridge. They're, <laughs> they're thinking, what is she saying? <laughs> Frig worthy. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. The, that girl ain't uh, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what they're thinking. But anyway. I can't see yes, any comments. Out. Ever since they made that change where it doesn't go through the Facebook thing like it used to in the group, I can't see comments anymore. So I can see the com. There's no comments right at the moment. I've got my comments mm -hmm. on. It's supposed okay. to, uh, I was seeing them all. I think nobody just said anything yet. I think that's the thing. And you know what I want to talk about tonight? Um, well, I, I wanted to tell you some of my adventures on the road, but cool. <laughs> um, I want to talk about in direct sales. I don't know how insurance is, but in direct sales, people get into this mindset that somehow summer is less somehow like less of a business opportunity, less you're going to have less sales just because it's summer. And I don't believe that personally. It's never been true all these years I've been in. And I'm surprised that people buy into that. Uh, do you have that in insurance or no one even talks about? No, no see, no, we never had people still buy that. stuff. People still need uh, the things that if you sell uh, commodities like I do, the uh, shampoo and salt, face cream, jewelry and all that, they buy that in the summer, obviously, yeah. and people need insurance in the summer. But I don't know why, whether it's because we're women, mostly in my group. Hey, Maureen. Hey, Maureen. Um, yeah, Maureen was on the call this afternoon, too. Um, and I don't know. Do you what do you think that's about? Or you'd never even heard that before. Uh, no, I've I've definitely heard things like that, and it and it varies because you could you could almost make it a blank and put people could put in any time frame. Oh, not just that. summer. Right. They say the like, beginning of the year is slow, or after yeah, school, the end of the year is slow. Oh, that, okay. that kind of thing, and okay. it, what it normally amounts to is people putting their own mindset in there. In most cases, now there are some exceptions, like in the insurance industry, especially in the employee benefits arena, you weren't going to get people making decisions at the very last few weeks of the year, usually to add a new benefit in there. So you had to have it lined up before then, even if you did the enrollment in December. And so what I used to always do is I would actually have accounts uh, that I was working on that I would line up and I would still, I would do the enrollment in December oftentimes because it gave us a huge December, but you weren't going to necessarily get the employer to make the decision during that time, but it never affected what the employees did. So it's, it tends to be our, our own thought processes. You know, if we like during the course of December, I, I did things in December, but I tried to do them in the first two weeks because when school let out, I took off with my kids the last two weeks. Used oh, to yeah. make my regional manager nuts. <laughs> he did not <laughs> like that. But it, was, it was what it was. Uh, but uh, I later, think you got to pre-plan. So 
and and think about whether you're thinking that because it's actually true, which is hardly ever the case, or you've heard it a lot, or I, I don't know. I think you have to decide because I, I don't I don't get that being on sales and commission. You can't. That's not. <laughs> I used to have a little sticker that it was a, or a little sticker, a little index card, I guess you'd say that was in front of my, or on my desk. I was about to say in front of my computer, but I'm, this was a while back. I'm not sure I had a computer, at that point. <laughs> but it basically said, uh, I choose not to participate in a downward economy. Right. And because if, if, they, if, you know, the economists have, uh, I think this was a Ronald Reagan quote, economists have correctly picked or forecasted 12 of the last three recessions. <laughs> so you can't really put a lot of stock in those things. So I just, I'm not going to participate. And I just did it. You know, I went and did my own thing the whole time. And it has everything to do with how you approach it. And that's why you've been really successful all these years. Well, and, and I, I don't know, to me, I've always um, concentrated on stuff that I thought people would buy regardless. I stop, mm -hmm. I try, I'm, just, I'm trying to stop saying it regardless regardless that, that is of, the correct thing you're doing there so. regardless of the fact that um penny. hey penny uh the time of year what we're doing like the mm -hmm. I'm i've yet to have somebody say to me you know what money's tight i'm foregoing deodorant you know i even, <laughs> i've yet to have someone say that to me and that's the same with shampoo that's the same mm -hmm. with bar soap or whatever they're right. washing with. And those are the kind of products that I sell. So it works out that way. And um, if, if you're selling space heaters, the summer might slack off a bit, but uh, you know, it, well, most things, it, it really doesn't. It, to me, if it does, then you should be selling air conditioners in the summer. You should have an alternative Perfect. plan. I don't yeah. know. I don't know, but it's a, it's all, it's personal responsibility. We're, we're back to that on commission. The other thing I hear a lot of, and th this fascinates me, I bet you don't hear this, but um, in direct sales, it's more of a volunteer army where there are a lot of people in it doing it for the social ability or whatever. They're not necessarily money minded. Right. Not necessarily so, trying to make a full time living at it or whatever. Right. So they'll say something to me along the lines of, I don't have time to go work my business. Maybe I'll come back to it. And I'm thinking to myself, if I had a job, you would, I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go to work this week. I, I guess <laughs> I never, I can't wrap my head around how you could, to me, I take this very seriously. Right. And, um, but I've also been able to support myself and a child, um, all these years off of on commission right so i guess that's 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 something well you know we did have the same thing in that respect in the insurance industry uh because uh that with uh my years with aflac nobody was an aflac employee from me down none of us and um the the as a result you are leading a volunteer army uh, matter of fact, I just had to send an email out or maybe in my queue to go out about sometimes it feels like you're herding cats because yeah. everybody's got their own thing going on and you're just trying to lead in the right way and, and pull it all together. And what I taught my people to look at was uh, think of it like you would a customer. You know, uh, if you have a customer who buys a ton of product every single month, then that's great. You love that customer. But if you, ha you have a customer who buys whatever they buy once or twice a year, that's okay. Because like uh, in my situation, we, they, uh, we would have people on the team that a, a good producer, really solid producer with us back then did about $200,000 in a year in sales volume mm -hmm. uh, on, on that. They'd make between 60 and $80,000 as their commission, not counting their renewals that would be coming in. So that would, they would make a decent living. And that, that's kind of our benchmark, $200,000 producer is what we try to get everybody to doing that or better. And you'd have some people that they do 50 or 60 grand in a year in production or a hundred thousand a year. And I remember having a conversation with one of my districts who was as sharp as a tack young man. And uh, he was kind of, he was looking for some coaching about how to work with people like that. And I said, Bill, think of them like a customer. If you went out right now and opened up a brand new account and the premium ran 50 grand a year, think about what you would make on that. 
and, and then treat this like uh, treat them like a customer. You're making an override on fifty grand a year. Okay, if it's not two hundred thousand, it's not two hundred thousand. But if you had a, a if you had a customer, a, a brand new employer group that was fifty thousand in premium, you'd take you'd take such good care of that account. You'd you would do everything other than change their diapers for them. I mean, <laughs> you take really good care because that was a good size. <laughs> And uh, it's just a mind shift. And so in direct sales, you, you inspire them. You want to lead them. You want to you want to coach them about that and meeting their needs. But if it's their needs and if, if they don't if they don't need to work during whatever time, you just love them anyway. And you just realize, OK, that person <laughs> is bringing more business to me than one customer might during the year, because at least right. part of the year they're selling. And you kind of look well, at it that way. Well, and, and that that's what gets me on the soapbox, though, because when someone says to me, I don't need the money, I think that's a tactical error because <laughs> they're usually saying that because they're relying on their spouse's income. And right. to me, that is a tactical error because men die sooner than women, for starters. Uh, all the all of the data shows that at some point everyone men and women are going to have to pay their own way in the world at some point right. so everyone should be able to carry their own nut or whatever it is yeah. <laughs> right that's a very that's a very valid point i remember when we first started talking about said the lady with the blue hair and we were talking uh, and you were working on getting the different rules together that you teach your team and all that uh, I remember one of the first things I asked you is, what's your main point? You, what is it that you really want to accomplish in, in this book? And that was the point you brought out that you wanted women to be self-sufficient because even if they're in a great relationship with a great marriage and a great income coming in, life can throw them a curve and they need to be ready for that. Well, and, and I'm actually, uh, I get confused by men <laughs> Who and right, thank you. Um, no, not you in particular. Bless our hearts. <laughs> Bless your hearts, right? Um, like I, I know husbands that I like them. I like their opinions on stuff, and I, they don't understand that by discouraging their wife from being self-sufficient, that they're actually doing her a very big disservice if they drop dead or if. And they'll say something like, uh, but I got insurance or something. But the right. problem with that is insurance, I, unless they're getting a million dollar policy or something like that, which many most people don't do that, um, right. the person is still going to need to produce money after a while. I don't think insurance right. will solve all problems. Right. Um, okay. Kyle's got a question. I actually, I'm seeing comments now. That's cool. Yeah, it says, either of you had success with the part-time producer, somewhere in that mode for two plus years. I'd say yes, Kyle, because yeah. that's the majority of my team is part-time producers. Right. I think. And How do you I, feel about that? Definitely the same. In in the it, of course, it all depend on depended on each person's individual needs. And, you know, we did a lot of goal setting and goal coaching so we could know what they were trying to achieve. And it wasn't we were trying to get them to hit our goal. We wanted to know what their goal was. Now, in management, yeah, we had people giving you the goals and the targets you need to hit, but not not for a, a producer. And uh, so we did have some that would be successful two plus years uh, that started from new but had lower income needs or lower income goals. And that's what they did. Most of our part time producers, though, in our in my particular situation, tended to be more of those who had been producing for a while and were scaling back. Yeah. And they, they didn't have to do it as much. Uh, but, you know, you get a veteran associate that was, uh, you know, they, they, they could go out and write 200 or 300,000 a year and make six figure income. Uh, but they had renewals and they so weren't they were, doing that. So the renewals were enough is why they were scaling back? Is that it? Yeah, that, that, it had to have part of it. We used to call it renewal-itis. Can't get them to go to work because I got the renewal so high. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, you know, the, 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 even then, though, I taught, my, I taught my management team the same thing. Coach them, guide them, try to inspire them, for, throw incentives that you can, do whatever you need to do. But at the same time, realize Treat them like they're your best customer because, yeah. and and uh, that like the average new account size for in for the employers that we were uh, dealing with in Houston, right now in the marketplace here it's about seventy five hundred dollars in annual premium sales. So a fifty thousand dollar accounts five more than five times the, the average. Yeah. So treat them like you would a large account. If they're putting in fifty thousand a year in production, 
uh, even though it's not what anyone would need. Probably, well, I say that I don't know anybody's income needs. It may not be what we think they should do, but you treat them value, and you focus well, with value, and you focus on them. Yeah. And life situations change. Hi, Lisa Williams, um, uh, Kyle. I've had pe I have had people on my team that they were just playing around and not doing anything for years, more than two years. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden they were in a position where they all of a sudden had to pay all the bills and got right. real serious and did ramp up. So um, I've also had people that were playing around and then quit and then come back years later and do big. So I try to treat everybody just like, you you know, where, where they're at, where they're, just like you said, just treat them, give them good service no matter what. Yeah. I guess I, the, the thing with me is I just wish that people would take it more serious as far as not just my opportunity, but all opportunities to earn as much money when, they, when they're when they physically able to do that. Right. Because and, there's going to be a time they won't be able to earn as much money because they're older or limited uh, mobility right. or whatever it is. And then they're going to need the money and they may not have it if they don't work as hard as they can when they right. can. Right. Kyle, by the way, that was an excellent question. Uh, type in there, Kyle, what industry you're in. I'd like to know what your industry in there. Hi, Lisa. And if I haven't said it already, hi, Penny. I think I did. And hi, Maureen. Penny, Maureen. Yeah, we were on the, we were doing send out cards, uh, Maureen today, and Peg was on. Yay. I bet Peg's listening too. Yeah. Yay. So, um, yeah, so that was my big thing is, uh, yeah, I, but that, uh, you know what? I've never, never, ever run across anybody who wants this as much as me. Right. I don't, well, I why. think you're always going to be the one that wants it the most, uh, you know what I mean? Whatever you're doing. Um, I've just been, at first you start thinking, oh, all I, all I need is to find someone else who's as driven as me about this, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. I don't think well, okay. Now we got a dual answer there. So, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, your, your point's valid. Uh, the, the thing that I always, uh, Oh, Kyle, you're uh, the Aflac who I was with. I don't know if you already knew that or not. Uh, so that, yeah, that I was a state manager for Aflac down in the, in the Houston, Texas area. They were, they were called a state sales coordinators back then. They call them market directors now and made them employees. And, uh, I, 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 if you cut me today, I will still bleed Aflac blue, but <laughs> trying to make me an employee might not be a great idea because I'm much better at shaving the boss's face than I am at kissing. <gasps> oh, never mind. I'll leave the rest of that comment out. Oh, never mind. <laughs> But uh, the, the thing is that I will honestly say about all of that is if uh, think in terms of a value proposition and, and when I'm coaching people about value propositions, my thing that I always say is that your value proposition has nothing to do with your opportunity. It has nothing to do with your company, it, uh, nothing about how great your product or service is, nothing about how great of a leader or person we are. The value proposition is 100% about how the other person's world gets better than if when they have a relationship with us. And so when it comes to your team, when you're when you're coaching and recruiting and building a team, uh, get to know uh, what get to know what their needs are. Focus on their value from that. Coach them, inspire them, help them hit their own goals, whatever those may be. Get them to stretch those goals, Lisa, because I think your point about being self-sufficient is huge. Uh, but whatever their goals are, you help them focus on that. And you you, you kind of look at it uh, as Bob and I put in streetwise to sales wise. Uh, it's the idea that uh, as the leader, you're the head server. Your, your, your job, if you can help everybody on your team hit their goals to whatever level they are and help them uh, build the life they want for their family, they'll stay with you forever. It's just what happens and they'll love you for it. Yeah, I, I just like to, uh, um, I think the only thing I've been sure of is, uh, is the setting a good example. So if I want people to work towards being able to live without getting a job job and just be independent, then I mm -hmm. better be able to do that to show that it's doable. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, yeah, Kyle said you guys had dinner together with Larry Denny. A long time How was, that, was I at that dinner? Gosh, that had to be back. Oh, gosh, a long time ago. Maybe when I came up and spoke fun. in Oklahoma that time. You guys had know. fun. 
Uh, well, anytime you're around Larry, Denny, and, and Kyle will understand this, it's going to be kind of entertaining. Let's just oh, leave it okay. at that. <laughs> but uh, and I actually saw Larry this week, uh, uh, as you know, and I don't know how much the audience knows, and I'm not going to let it go in a downward direction, but uh, my longtime mentor with AFLAC, my state sales coordinator, Frank Davies, passed away uh, earlier this month, and we I was at his funeral uh, this last week, and Larry and his wife came in, and oh. so it was good to reconnect there. But I well, it must be like honestly, old home day, yeah, where you saw yeah. a bunch of your oh, that's nice, bunch of them, yeah. Oh. And uh, I, I say this without reservation that Larry Denny uh, is one of the reasons I was successful with Aflac, and he's also one of the reasons that the phrase that boy ain't right was in Denny, <laughs> <laughs> and he and I were good friends because of that, I'm sure. But, uh, Larry, uh, was uh, back when a million dollar district with Applack was a really big deal. Um, Larry was one of the very first uh, million dollar districts or, uh, and then he just blew it away. Mm. And one of the reasons that, that my career took off is he was, uh, we were friends and he was kind enough to share what he was doing. And so I kind of I tweaked it and did some of my own stuff. And that helped me. As a matter of fact, the night I got the call asking me if I wanted to be a state sales manager, Larry was actually in town at my apartment at the time. And, and when I got the call, and then oh, Larry wow. got the very next call because he was the very next person that became oh, the state sales coordinator. Wow, uh, yeah. that's Sandy. Yeah, Kyle said uh, he's sorry to hear that. So he didn't know about uh, Frank. Uh, so yeah. uh, he'd, he'd been struggling for a long time with health issues. And I had gone up to see him twice during the, the last few years. Uh, and he his issue was dementia and Alzheimer's. And he couldn't, you know, he remembered me. The first time, definitely. And a matter of fact, he, uh, uh, I, and uh, another lady that a friend, Cami Miller, uh, we we all we took him to lunch. Had a great day. The next time I came up, he remembered me, but it was tougher. And oh. then uh, a couple of days before he died, I actually got to go up and see him in hospice care, and oh. it was a very poignant moment for me. Uh, but uh, he was one of my life's mentors, and so I, I was I was given that opportunity. He he was. He wasn't conscious, but I got to go through no. and tell him how much you meant to yeah, him. Yeah, that, that disease sucks. That's it all there is to it. it uh, Maureen said, I've learned so much this past year from Lisa. Oh, thank you, Maureen, about how to treat people on a team and how not to treat them. I have also learned it isn't about me. It's about them. Yeah, it's it's a yeah. service. Yeah, and well, actually, isn't just about everything we're doing. I, I'm thinking again about the play. Um, it was. It's a opportunity to serve my community in a way I haven't been able to do. I, you know, it's funny. I can't believe this has been such a good fit <laughs> because I really didn't have a lot of play interest and mm -hmm. the people in the play community are, don't have a lot in common with me because I haven't been. And matter of fact, I don't want to be in the play. Almost everybody in the play universe um, wants to be in it or somehow, or they're trying to get in it or trying to get the director's attention for some other thing. And I just want to serve because I, uh, my skill set is something needed that I noticed that was needed because Kenny mm -hmm. needs an assistant. Come on now. <laughs> and I know how to do that because I've been somebody's assistant. So once I, I found a spot for myself, this just has made the most sense of anything I've tried to do in town. Right. So, and it is, it does help my business because the number of people who now know what I do that didn't before. Right. Um, right. It was, I mean, before a lot of people knew because I ran for office, but mm -hmm. now when I see somebody, they don't say that they say, aren't you the one doing the play thing? Or yeah. So yeah. It's, so, it's so you're the hair producer, director, assistant with the blue hair now. So you're, oh, you're, you're leaving me for him, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know oh, what you're doing there? It, it, it is a good thing. It's a, a good community service uh, and you are growing your business. And it's one of those things that even though you've taken a role where you're behind the scenes, making magic happen that not everybody would know. Uh, it's like I was saying, you can accomplish anything in life as long as you really don't care who gets the credit. And that's kind of been me. Oh, that, that doesn't right. mean I don't have an ego. I do. But yeah. uh, I, I don't, the thing that's always thrilled me the most is watching my people do well. And watching them get the awards and doing uh, the things that it it just it touches well, to me. me the, yeah, the to me this particular thing. Um, I, I don't know. I may be. Oh, I 
I, in direct sales, we've had a lot of recognition, a lot of trophies, a lot of on stage time and all that stuff. That stuff doesn't have the big meaning to me that it did at one point. Right. So to me, like with the play, the payoff for me is when it comes together, when when we do have a full house, when there's a line out the door or when everybody's uh, smiling and talking with each other because of something I, I did or everybody's got their binders and they've got their name on it and they're happy. <laughs> you know, what I mean? yep. Little things like that. If I can make those things happen because of my skill set. I, I I actually prefer not to be pointed out. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but it, I'm I'm just trying to do my bit. You know what I mean? So I'm just I mean, happy I got a spot. Well, yeah. you're kind of like me. Me going across the stage to get a President's Club Award or a Founders Club Award or whatever. That was all well and good, but it it wasn't a, wasn't something that I necessarily needed. Maybe I needed it more than I'm willing to admit. But oh I don't no, think back I really then did. I did. Back then I yeah. did. Didn't you yeah. at the beginning? Back then I did. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yes, maybe no. But when I got uh, started building my team and I would watch my team get an award, yeah, that was a different experience for me. It, it touched a different part of my brain. It, it, everything was different on that for me. Now, the recognition for me, though, was a stepping stone because I knew I could be successful at anything if more people knew what I did. And right. every time I got to do something that I got a lot of recognition for or whatever, like on stage right. or whatever, it led to other things that got me more well-known. So um, yeah. Uh, somebody, point. yeah, I spoke at a conference and there, there was one of the leaders from the UK. They invited me over to speak because of seeing me speak over here. Every time it was something, it was all a, a chain of events that happened. Mm -hmm that usually had something to do with a recognition thing. So I was happy to do that oh, yeah. and happy to get it because it furthered my business along down the pike, I think. Yeah. But uh, yeah. It, I, I got to where, uh, and I'm not saying this to think about my stuff. All right. But I, I had, uh, I used to have display cabinets for different awards in the front of my office and all that. And then more in the back and Aflac was great about, just doing a ton of that. Uh, but it got to the point I started thinking, okay, I need to make space, but I don't want to add more stuff. And so I'm just thinking, okay, well, what can I take away? And, and it was, uh, uh, it was odd to me, I guess, maybe I, I, I don't, I don't know my own motivators. I, I'll tell you my, my motivators have more to do with emotion, the emotional side. Although I will tell you, I had a little bit of a hallelujah breakdown the first year I made a hundred grand. <laughs> I did. Okay. That might've been a little bit more about I love that. <laughs> it was so silly. I grew up so dirt poor. Uh, that literally, uh, you know, I always tell everybody I wasn't poor. My mama was poor. She just took me with her everywhere. she went. <laughs> But I was, I grew up in a very non affluent lifestyle and I used to think if you made a hundred thousand dollars a year, you were just goat stinking rich. You could not spend that much money. And then uh, what I'd learned once I began to make a hundred thousand a year is you, you adapt. <laughs> the things we think, right? I know. Well, back then, if I remember the numbers correctly, I started with Apple like in 93. And that first year I made about that partial year, I made about 25 grand or something like that. And the next year I made over 50, the next year over 80, then I was over six figures and I've been over six figures with that. Like even now that I've been retired 10 years for what is that now? 30, almost 30. Heck, I can't remember. 31 years is how long I've been with the company. So probably 28, 28. And I'm technically with the company, but I haven't done anything in 10 years. I'm retired from that just so I can write. Uh, but uh, the, uh, it is a unique perspective and it's a good one, but it can also spoil you. You get renewal itis. That's what I say. You get oh, renewal itis. Yeah. So. You got to stay right, right. And by the way, Kyle, if you haven't read the new book that Bob Berg and I did, uh, Streetwise to Saleswise, Become Objection Proof and Beat the Sales Blues, you're going to love that book because it, of what it teaches, especially about financial services and and uh, and then uh, the insurance industry, especially, but it's applicable to all industries. But you'll see some things in there that you'll like a lot, I think. So. Yeah, Lisa Williams said you sell the solution, not the product. That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. The sizzle, not the steak. Isn't that what they say? Yeah, yeah. 
That's I think awesome. Lisa, oh, uh, Lisa also put in something earlier about Sales Wise Live. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you mentioning that. Uh, we go, I'm flying to West Palm Saturday. Laurie and I leave Saturday morning. Oh, that's right. Early. The, the yeah, Streetwise. And, uh, yeah. And the event starts Sunday night. And I, I've hired, we've hired a Dixieland band to come in and play because, as you know, the, the storyline awesome. of Streetwise, Sales Wise is set in New Orleans and the music plays such a flavor in the thing. So, We've got that going, and then we're doing a, a two-day uh, intensive sales mastery event. I want to call it a retreat because it's in a gorgeous hotel, but it's a, an event. And it's Bob Berg, Kim Angeli, and myself. And uh, this one is is uh, the registration's already closed on this one. We will do another one at the end of September. And on this next one, by the way, Lisa, this might be something that interests you because I know some things you're not discussed there'll be a payment plan on the next one. So you can oh. divide it out. So it'll give you a, a oh. little better opportunity if that's what you want. So. That would be nice. Uh, Kim Angeli, her, my favorite quote of hers is it's not your customer's job to remember you. It's your job to be unforgettable. Isn't that the greatest quote? That. Isn't that I awesome? Love that. Yeah. That, that's my, that, that actually hits my thing right on the head. <laughs> it does. I tried to be unforgettable. Uh, Maureen said, Jeff, when I was teaching and got my first paycheck, I asked them if they had made a mistake because up to then I had never made that much money. That's awesome. I get it. <laughs> That's like Maureen, my first job out of college, I was going to teach, but there weren't any teaching jobs open where I needed to be so that my wife could finish up school. And uh, so I took a job with a musical instrument company in sales and they paid me it was a draw against commissions, but they made the draw against my commissions exactly the same as it would have been had I gotten the teaching job with a master's degree and the band director stipend. And it was 14000 a year. <laughs> and after taxes, I'm, I think I brought home maybe $800 a month or something like that. And <laughs> for me, it wasn't the most money I'd made in the month, but it was the most money I'd ever made on a full-time job in a month. Uh, when I was playing in the Dixieland band, we'd have some weeks where I made more than that just because of the gig style economy or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I, I, I feel your pain, Maureen, but we're not doing that anymore. So. <laughs> uh, Lisa Williams said, Jeff, keep me updated on that payment plan. And uh, she said September for doing the other one. Well, guess I got to make enough money this summer to quit my school job. <laughs> <laughs> or at least yeah. take three days off. It'll be, yeah, I think it's September 22nd through the 24th. I think it, it, the, the dates for the next one are actually already updated. If you go to sales wise line, oh, awesome. uh, it's already there. Uh, there's still some, uh, we're doing a little, little tweaks on, on the, the website because we're going to do it by application this time. And oh, you know, you'll, nice. But uh, the one of the things, too, we have is a surprise for the one in September. Uh, Richard Wildman is going to come <gasps> in and be our special guest. Oh, and he's going to do a, a session. Like oh, he's awesome. And for those of you that don't know Richard Wildman, it's spelled W-E-Y-L-M-A-N. Look this guy up. He is absolutely amazing. And he's worked with companies that they make the customer experience so wonderful that they, these places won't go anywhere else. I, I laugh. I, I always say that about Chick-fil-A. It's amazing to me that Chick-fil-A is the number one fast food <laughs> restaurant in the country when they're only open about 85% of the time the other companies yeah. are open because they won't open on Sunday. They're not going to open on holidays. <laughs> and so it's pretty cool. But Richard Wildman, I think he's even worked with them. And so it's pretty amazing. Well, let me, let me wrap up by telling you the, a little bit of a story. <laughs> oh boy, here we go. The kid, well, no, it's funny. The kid's working up at Tropical Smoothie now. Mm -hmm. So okay. uh, he's he's um, jumping around jobs a little bit. He did Dunkin' and then he dishwashed for a while at the seafood place. And now he's at Tropical Smoothie and doing DoorDash. I'm mm -hmm. not upset by that, even though everybody seems to be upset for me. <laughs> because these are the first jobs he's ever had. I yeah. jump around a little too. He's got to be able to check stuff out. What I'm so impressed with and I'm so happy about, and I, at night I go, mama, <laughs> <laughs> is because I went up there and bought a smoothie and a salad from him when he was on duty. He was on the register. That kid knows how to do customer service because we've talked about it so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's funny how every job he's taken, uh, they usually put him on, on the front line because... He knows what he's doing as far as interacting with customers. And I am so happy about that because that opens up his possibilities for work. When mm -hmm. you can have um, some kind of thought process on what should be happening. And even I've talked about the franchise thing so much that he says, um, 
Tropical Smoothie is way better a franchise than Dunkin' Donuts because they don't have they have it laid out every little step. He said they've dumbed it down and that's what a franchise is. And I'm like, bingo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm I'm happy to find out that all that blab and I've been doing about all this stuff actually sunk in. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think he was listening, did you? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> That's right. My mother never thought I was listening either. So, and she was right. I'm just, I'm so, that's terrible. I'm sorry. No, I thought it was the same as uh, make sure you bring home your dirty dishes. Yeah, I say that every day, and no, no dishes come. Right? Yeah, well, I thought it was like that. Hey, you're swinging for the fence. Be happy with a good solid single. All right. Right. <laughs> uh, Lisa says, nice eye candy in that smoothie place. Oh, yeah, she was looking. They, he had a big line of military people in there when I went up there. And it was funny because, of course, I went live with my phone and the kids like, oh, I'm a... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, hi, young man. <laughs> and then when I was done filming, I got through. I'm, I like. Uh, that's my kid at the register. That's my kid. And my and the kid's going, oh, mom. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, Lisa said, uh, you're a great example as a business owner. And mom, oh, thank you. That's I like the, the biggest compliment. Yeah. So anyway, we're, on, we're at time already. Yep, this half hour go. always goes fast. But, I'm so glad we had this time. I probably shouldn't sing that on our show because it may violate copyright rules. No, so. please, please. Yeah, if you're not getting in trouble once in a while, you're just not trying hard yeah, enough. Yeah. Really. <laughs> I've heard that. Where, wait, you know, know, somebody should put that in a book. I, somebody should. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right, I know. Uh, you thank you for uh, sharing your insights about the, it being a mental situation about the summer thing though, because that's, that's a big topic right now. When school gets out, everybody loses their mind and they can still make some money. I think the trick is make your job interweave with your life so that you don't have to set it aside to work. Yep. Be, I don't know, have it part of your world. So anyway, what? As, as Conway would say, you need to plan ahead and squirrel some of that money back. <laughs> and squirrel some of that money back. <laughs> yeah. Con Conway is really ticking me off lately, but we don't have time for that. So. Conway. Poor Conway. I want you Poor to get a little Conway. harness and be walking Conway and stuff. <laughs> That would be hilarious. I pay good money for that. I really ain't been seeing that. <laughs> I'd go I'd fly down there and go live to see you walk in Conway. <laughs> oh my goodness. Walk in my squirrel. <laughs> they would put me in a home. <laughs> <laughs> Why does that sound dirty? Walking your squirrel. I'm sorry. I, did, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> Sure you did. <laughs> well, we're gonna uh, let we're gonna let Jeff go walk his squirrel, and <laughs> uh, and next week, uh, who who do you have subbing for me next week while I'm in Florida? Is it? Uh, it's a Peg? surprise. I'm gonna oh, okay. I'm gonna have a sub. It's gonna be okay. someone we haven't seen yet, and it's gonna be oh, a cool. surprise. So cool tune in next week while we have a sub for Mr. Jeff while he's in Florida doing an awesome job with the Streetwise event and then come back the week after and we will we will talk about the sub. <laughs> it's going to be someone we haven't had yet. So. Is it going to be Richard Wildman? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good guess, but no. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm saying all this because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking I know right now. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, oh, thank you very much, everybody. We appreciate you spending time with us. <laughs> and we old. love you all. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>